الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فلا مضل له ومن يدلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار After praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending immense greetings and salutations upon the final prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam we find that to fail to plan is to plan to fail that is a famous cliche from amongst the non-muslims that we find and possibly even sums up us muslims today as well that for many of us there is no vision there is no strategical approach in what we want to gain or what we want to achieve in our lives. Everything is just carried out in a hap haphazard manner that we just see every day as it comes and as it goes. And some may take offense to beginning our lecture with the statement that to fail to plan is to plan to fail is a statement of the non-Muslims. And here we should understand that those statements of non-Muslims on many occasions they return back to Muslims because we know al-hikmah dalatul mu'min wisdom is the lost property of the believer and whenever the believer finds that wisdom has the most right to reclaim that lost property some people try to make this a hadith but ulama of hadith have made a strong critique and question the authenticity but the meaning is true the meaning is accurate it goes back to numerous members of the Salaf that we find. Wisdom is the lost property of the believer. What the Sharia prohibits us from, because we find there's many extreme elements in our Muslim society that anything that comes from non-Muslims is to be rejected. If it's something of urf, of custom, of culture, of general behavior, and does not go against the Sharia, فَلَا مَانِعِ وَلَا حَرَجِ There's no harm and no prevention in following those etiquettes or those statements, whatever they may be. There's no harm in that. The harm or the forbiddance that we find inside the hadith and sunan of Abi Dawood, man tashabbaha bi qawmin fahuwa minhum. Whoever begins to imitate a people, eventually becomes like them. In terms of aqa'id, in terms of belief, in terms of akhlaq, characteristics, was salukiyat, certain etiquettes of behavior which are specific to them. If we begin to imitate them in those practices, then that is the nahi, that is the forbiddance. Other than that, anything which is khair, anything which is good, as we mentioned in general, returns back to al-Islam. Sometimes we may have forgotten about it or may become something prominent amongst non-Muslims. And that is why I began today's reminder for myself and to the rest of you brothers and sisters to begin to think of the greater goal, the greater vision. It's not haram to plan and to have a vision. That's what some Muslims, they think. That to have stages in what we want to gain or achieve in our life and likewise specifically in this month of Ramadan. Yes, it's obviously true. وَعِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ السَّاعَةِ To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the knowledge of the hour and knows which land we will die in, knows what we will inherit, what wealth we will possess, belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But that does not prevent the believer from planning their life and what they want to do. So we find that before even Ramadan enters, we will be ill-prepared through Ramadan, possibly ill-prepared towards the end of Ramadan, and years go by. 
Years go by, we still seem to be ill-prepared for this great blessed month. So firstly, we want to look at the preparation by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, there's no comparison between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepares, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى To Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala belongs the greatest example. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ Nothing is like unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the all-hearing, the all-seeing. But just to help us to understand is in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prepares for us human beings in general and specifically in the month of Ramadan and then what do we in return give back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show our gratitude, our belief and our conviction towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first thing that we find is as we began with the disbelievers, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the preparation for these disbelievers, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, فَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ وَعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ Fear that fire whose fuel is men and stones, وَعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ That's what we're trying to focus upon tonight, inshallah, preparation. That fire whose fuel is men and stones has been prepared for the disbelievers. Another passage in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَعَدَّ لِلْكَافِرِينَ عَذَابًا مُهِينًا Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared a most humiliating torment, punishment for a disbelieving individuals. Likewise, in such surah Al-Imran, we find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned, وَاتَّقُوا النَّارَ الَّتِي وَعِدَّتْ لِلْكَافِرِينَ Fear that fire which has been prepared for the disbelieving individuals. And then from there, a few verses later, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to mention the path of the believers and the preparation for the believers. وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ أَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ Race with one another in gaining that garden, that paradise, whose width is, width is like the heavens and the earth. أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ which has been prepared now for whom? For the pious individuals. And then the characteristics are mentioned of the pious individuals. الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ Those who spend in the times of adversity, of hardships, and times of ease. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْفِ Those who literally swallow their anger. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ Those who pardon mankind. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ these are the characteristics of the muttaqun. Because some of us, we think that we're pious. Some of us just conclude in a way that we dress or certain things that we may say, concludes that we're pious. No. Not to diminish the symbols of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the inner core element of taqwa that we find. These are the descriptive natures of the muttaqun, the pious individuals. Those who spend of their wealth in times of not just ease, of adversity, difficulties. And that's the Quran it mentions, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ You'll never attain piety until you don't spend of the things that you love. I read the tafsir of Ibn Kathir regarding this ayah. If I'm not mistaken, talking about the companion Abu Talha, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that we find. Or Talha, if I'm not mistaken, Talha ibn Ubaidillah, whereby you find he had this beautiful garden. That even the Prophet Muhammad would go there and drink from the fountain, drink from the well, and eat from the fruits. But he gave this garden away. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's a path of the muttaqoon. Then we find bearing the comments of people. What people may say. وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ Muttaqoon, pious individuals are those who literally swallow their anger. They only get angry for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's people who say different things, who make different accusations, whatever it may be. But the pious individuals swallow their anger. Then on top of that, وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ They pardon mankind. They forgive people. That is an attribute of the muttaqoon. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves the doers of good. Likewise, if I another passage of the Qur'an, that this has been prepared. الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرُسُلِهِ This garden has been prepared for the pious individuals who believe in Allah and His Messenger. Likewise, in Hadith Qudsi that we find, أَعْدَدْتُ لِعِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحِينَ مَا لَا عَيْنٌ رَأَتْ وَلَا عُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ وَلَا خَطَرَ عَلَى قَلْبِ بَشَرٍ I prepared for my servants what no eye has seen, 
what no ear has heard, and the feeling or the perception has not come on the mind or the heart of any human being. And then the messenger recited the verse, فَلَا تَعْلَمُ نَفْسٌ مَا أُخْفِيَ لَهُمْ مِنْ قُرَّةِ أَعْيُنْ جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ No soul knows the coolness of the eyes of that which has been created for those individuals. For what reason? جَزَاءً بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ A recompense, reward for their actions they used to do upon this earth. That is the creed of Ahl Sunnah. Life isn't just about making claims. Life of a believer is making the belief and to carry out that belief via the actions. That's what aqidah in a nutshell of Ahl Sunnah is. There are many technical discussions or technical any dissection that we find. A person needs to study in the life of aqidah. But some of us just being an average Muslim, it becomes something difficult. The theological debate that begins to take place. But if you can just understand this element inside your life, and inshallah you'll be successful throughout your life. Al-Iman yazidu bil-ta'ati wa yanqus bil-ma'asiyati. Iman goes up via obedience towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it plummets, it goes down via disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you understand this, then your life will be a successful life of devotion towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we cannot understand the theological rhetoric that begins to take place or discussions that begin to take place is not for every single individual to have that ability to understand the arguments of those rationistic approaches and those approaches that go against ahl sunnah it's not for everyone because some people think every single muslim every single muslim needs to be a specialist it's not possible because some of these claims or some of these beliefs they go way beyond the mind of an average individual so what we can understand from aqidah, from belief, is to have that simple belief, which is a powerful belief. It's very simple, but if you hold that belief, it's very powerful. وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُمْ وَاللَّهُ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ بَصِيرٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over you wherever you are. He is the all-seeing, the all-hearing. That's aqidah, that's belief. You have that, that's it. You're successful throughout your life. You understand that inside your life, live by that, that you are weary that wherever you are, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watching over us and knows our actions, knows our inner thoughts, knows what our eyes are concealing or what our hearts are concealing. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for us believers. And then we find an even more specific preparation in the month of Ramadan. So imagine that's just general what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prepared for the muttaqun inside paradise. And even more so inside paradise what is the preparation or sorry inside Ramadan that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes? The preparation that we find on the first day of Ramadan, the first night of Ramadan, what happens in the hadith of Bukhari Muslim? All of the doors of paradise are flung open. All of them are swung open. And all of the doors of Jahannam are what? Are sealed. And all of the devils are chained up. Here you find ulama of hadith begin to make a discussion, how come this still happens to be some evil in our society? So different interpretations be given. Some of them say that Rusu Shayateen, the leaders of the devils, don't want to name them today in public, huh? they, are, they are chained up. <laughs> but the other small Shayateen still exist. Or we find devils amongst whom, as the Quran mentions, devils from amongst mankind. So the jinn may have been tied up, but there's still going to be devils around us. There's people around us who are devils. They still exist. Other ulama mention that the evil within the individual it comes out in Ram, even in Ramadan. That those people still have that evil corruption inside themselves and they're not able to withhold themselves, restrain themselves. It comes out. And that's the Quran mentions, إِنَّ النَّفْسَ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي This soul, it yearns towards evil. If it's placed inside that environment, which is conducive towards evil, it will come out and go towards that evil. إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي Except for the soul, which has the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon it. And the evidence from this ayah is crystal clear. 